Engineering Controls for Nanomaterials. My name is Tom Peters of the University of Iowa. By the end of this module, learners should be able to describe how engineering fits within the broader hierarchy of controls, understand operating principles of different types of engineering controls, relate engineering controls to specific nanotechnology processes, identify ways to evaluate engineering controls. First, I would like to recall the industrial hygiene framework. Risk management in industrial hygiene involves a circular path as follows. First, the industrial hygienist must anticipate and recognize hazards in the workplace. Then, hazards are evaluated, which involves measurement and comparison to occupational exposure limits. If needed, controls are put in place and confirmed that they work. Then the cycle repeats with hopefully continuous improvement in managing all hazards within a workplace. It is important to document all observations and results throughout this process. Engineering controls fit within the broader context of the hierarchy of controls, which we have seen before. The most preferred control is elimination of the hazard from the workplace. Sometimes referred to as prevention through design, hazards can be eliminated by changing the process to avoid certain chemicals, or hazardous chemicals can be substituted for less hazardous ones. Prevention through design works best when integrated in the development of a new process. Engineering controls are also preferred because they can be highly effective without requiring the involvement of the worker. Thus, the use of engineering controls reduces the potential for worker behavior to impact exposures. Ventilation is the primary engineering control, and we will spend most of our time talking about special ways to ventilate the workplace. In contrast, work practices, administrative controls, and personal protective equipment are less preferred because they require significant worker involvement to be effective and they do not remove hazards from the workplace. First, I will mention some non-ventilation engineering controls. Guards and barricades can be used to separate workers from hazards. Water sprays can be used to reduce respirable dust concentrations. Materials can be treated to make them less hazardous. An example is to treat a dry, dusty material by wetting it before it's handled. Flexible and disposable glove bags, like that shown at right, can be a cost-effective way to avoid contamination of the workplace when handling engineered nanomaterials. Rigid glove boxes are a non-ventilated enclosure that have a special entry exit port for chemicals and ports with gloves. This system allows for complete isolation of a chemical from the worker. They were originally developed for the pharmaceutical industry, but now commonly applied to nanotechnology for small scale handling of powders. Continuous liners for bag filling are another non-ventilation engineering control. Filling product into a container is a common final step in nanomaterial production. Continuous liners can be used to maintain a barrier between the product and the worker at all times. This system is highly effective at eliminating exposures. Now, let's turn our attention to ventilation. Engineering controls have been used to ventilate contaminants from the workplace for a long, long time. This image comes from one of my favorite books, De Re Metallica, which translates to Of Metal, written in 1556 by Agricola. In the book, a story from the Roman Pliny the Elder is retold and depicted in this wonderful wood carving. Pliny describes that the air becomes noxious with depth, which can be remedied by constantly shaking linen cloths 
thus setting the air in motion. Other wood carvings from De Re Metallica depict how to mechanically ventilate mines. On the left, a worker uses a gigantic bellows to push clean air into the mine shaft. At right, another worker is making fans with different types of blades as an alternative way to get clean air into the mine. All hazards can be controlled, but the installation and operation of a ventilation system is a substantial expense for a company. Workplace contaminant levels can be reduced further and further, well below regulatory standards and the threshold limit values. However, increasing effectiveness usually comes with higher costs and systems that are more complex and difficult to implement. However, not controlling exposures also costs money in the form of increased health care costs, potential fines, and potential lawsuits. A critical task of the industrial hygienist is to understand and accurately present the costs associated with installing and operating a ventilation system versus the costs associated with not doing so. Some ventilation engineering controls are classified as general ventilation, with the word general indicating that the entire workplace is ventilated. The heating and cooling system used in your home is an example of a general ventilation system. In a general ventilation system, relatively clean air, typically from outdoors, is used to dilute contaminants and move them out of the workplace. General ventilation includes natural ventilation, which is essentially to open a window. This type of open the window ventilation was commonly used before air conditioning with heat generated in the factory causing natural convection of outdoor air into the building, diluting contaminants and moving them out of the facility. Many old factories were designed to have sloped roofs to encourage this natural convection. General ventilation can also be achieved mechanically. In the case shown at right, clean air is pushed into the building through ducts and discharged near the workplace floor. This air is then pulled out of the building and exhausted through a stack. Alternatively, this air can be cleaned and recirculated to reduce heating and cooling costs. In contrast, local exhaust ventilation systems evacuate contaminated air at the source. These systems can be very large, such as the multi-canopy hood system shown here. Multiple hoods or enclosures are used to evacuate contaminated air where it is produced or local to the source. The contaminated air passes through connecting ductwork and air cleaner and is then exhausted outside the facility through a stack. Air from a local exhaust ventilation system can be cleaned and then recirculated back into the facility, but this practice should be restricted to contaminants of low toxicity. Air is moved through the system by a large industrial fan. We will spend most of our time today on local exhaust ventilation systems because these systems are most effective at reducing exposures in the workplace. Local exhaust ventilation systems can also be small and self-contained. They have the same components as the larger system, a hood designed to evacuate the contaminant, in this case from a welding, connecting ductwork to move the contaminant to an air cleaner, and finally, the air cleaner and an air mover. In this case, the filter and air mover are contained in a single housing. Hoods are the entry point to the ventilation system. 
They have unique designs to serve a given operation or process. For example, we show a canopy hood used to ventilate hot vapor from a dip tank. Hoods are effective when operated at a specific air flow rate, commonly abbreviated with the symbol Q, and measured in the duct just downstream of the hood. Connecting ductwork serves to transport the contaminant from the hood to the air cleaner. Ductwork is sized to achieve a minimum transport velocity, symbolically represented with a capital V. Minimum transport velocity depends on the type of material being conveyed. Vapors and gases are easy to move, so transport velocity can be low relative to the high transport velocities required to move heavy dusts such as sand from casting metal. I want to make sure that we don't confuse airflow with velocity. Airflow, Q, is equal to the velocity of air in the duct, V, times the cross-sectional area of the duct, A, which can be written as Q equals V times A. Rearranging, we can express velocity as the airflow divided by area. For a round duct, cross-sectional area is equal to pi over 4 times duct diameter squared. So the velocity in the duct can be expressed as 4 times airflow divided by pi times diameter squared. This means that the airflow velocity in the duct can be adjusted by changing the diameter of the connecting ductwork. And this is exactly what ventilation engineers do. They use the largest duct diameter that provides the minimum transport velocity. Higher velocities simply require more power and ultimately cost more money to operate. Air cleaners serve, obviously, to clean the air. How well they clean the air depends on the purpose. If the air is being exhausted outside, then they need to be designed to meet air pollution regulations. Alternatively, they need to be effective enough to protect workers if the air is recirculated back into the facility. Air cleaners also serve to protect the fan as some gases are highly corrosive and some particles can erode the fan blades. There are many different types of air cleaners depending on the contaminant being cleaned. Spray towers are used to absorb gases. Granular beds can be used to adsorb gases. Cyclones and bag filters are common air cleaners for particles. I will spend some more time on hoods as they are the point of entry into local exhaust ventilation system. There is a wide variety of hoods available, with a selection depending strongly on the operation being ventilated. We will review hoods in the following three categories. Enclosing hoods completely or partially enclose the source of the contaminant. Capturing hoods use the airflow of the exhaust system to reach out and capture the contaminant. Receiving hoods are aligned with the energy of the source that helps them receive the contaminant. We need a few terms introduced before starting. We've already introduced duct velocity, which when multiplied by duct area gives us air flow. As shown at left, the source is fully or partially enclosed in an enclosing hood. Typically, the face velocity is specified for these hoods to ensure the contaminants from the source do not enter the workplace. As shown at right, the source is located outside of a capturing hood. In this case, the velocity of the air at the source, referred to as the capture velocity, must be sufficiently high to pull the contaminant into the hood. Oftentimes, capturing hoods use slots to ensure adequate capture velocity across a wide area. If so, the velocity of air entering the slot, the slot velocity, and velocity downstream of the slot 
the plenum velocity are usually specified. Enclosing hoods are designed to keep the contaminant inside the hood with escape prevented by limiting openings. Examples of full enclosures include an abrasive blasting cabinet. The worker puts a part to be cleaned into the cabinet through the access door. The door is closed and the abrasive blasting process is done by the worker through gloves in the front of the cabinet. The airflow for a full enclosure must be sufficient to keep air velocity moving inward at all gaps and to evacuate the enclosure before it is opened. Enclosing hoods also include partial enclosure like the paint spray booth shown at right. The velocity at the face of the paint spray booth is high enough to ensure that paint and solvent gases do not enter the workplace. Here we show full enclosures for machining of metal parts. The doors of the enclosure open, parts are manually or automatically inserted, the doors close and machining is performed by a computer control. The door is open, the part is exchanged, and the next part is machined. This arrangement provides high effectiveness of control with low airflow. However, getting parts in and out often presents difficulties. Here we show a full enclosure for a machining process. The process is fully enclosed with a door that allows access to the machine for service or part changeout. Air from outside the enclosure is pulled in through any gaps in the enclosure. The door is essentially a large gap, and when open, air velocity into the door is slow. When the door is closed, the gaps are small, and the inward velocity can easily keep contaminants inside the enclosure. In this case, we show a part being drilled with oil used as a coolant. The oil and metal chips stay within the enclosure with the door closed. If the door is open too soon after the process finishes, then contaminants can escape out of the large open door. This problem can be avoided by giving sufficient time for contaminants to purge from inside the enclosure before opening the door. Chemical fume hoods are a very important type of enclosing hood, commonly found in industry, research, and academia. There are different types of chemical fume hoods. Traditional fume hoods that use constant volume airflow are the most common. We will talk about them at length in the next slide. Other types of fume hoods provide constant velocity at the face by variably controlling airflow. Later in this presentation, we will discuss smaller specialty hoods that have become available for powder handling. Chemical fume hoods are an important class of enclosing hood. Shown here in side view, air is pulled from an exhaust duct with baffles and slots used to direct airflow. Often, a storage cabinet below the work surface is held at negative pressure for safe storage of chemicals. A sash is used to open and close the hood face, and its position changes the airflow patterns. When the sash is fully up, most of the air enters through the hood face. When in the middle position, some air passes through a bypass grill, the hood face, and an airfoil. Finally, when the sash is in the lowest position, air enters the hood from the bypass grill and airfoil only. These different arrangements facilitate good capture for a range of different situations. The position of items emitting contaminants or sources affects the efficiency of the chemical fume hood. Sources placed near the front of the hood can escape capture. 
Instead, sources should be placed at least 6 inches and preferably 10 inches from the opening so that contaminants can follow a safe path toward the exhaust duct. Although harder to reach, contaminants from sources placed near the back of the hood will typically stay away from the front opening. As shown in the top view at left and the side view at right, chemical fume hoods are designed so that the air enters perpendicular to the hood face. However, a worker can dramatically influence this airflow pattern. A low pressure region develops as air is pulled around the worker, generating a recirculation pattern in front of the worker. For this reason, it's important to keep the sash as low as possible when working with hazardous chemicals. With the sash too high, contaminants can easily escape and move into the person's breathing area. Lowering the sash reduces this problem by placing a barrier between the worker and the contaminant. The lower sash also limits the amount of recirculation zone in front of the worker. Avoid placing unnecessary items in the fume hood for storage. These items can obstruct the proper airflow from the front of the hood to the rear slots. Use a small table or shelf to elevate necessary items and allow airflow to flow under the table. Never place anything on top of the airfoil or directly in front of the rear slots. In addition, when using a chemical fume hood, avoid cross drafts such as those from foot traffic, fans, windows, doors, or sealing air diffusers. Drafts can dramatically change airflow patterns and cause contaminants to escape capture entering the room. Also avoid rapid movements such as rapidly pulling your arms out of the hood. Such actions can also change airflow patterns allowing contaminants to again enter the room. A biosafety cabinet is another common enclosing hood specifically designed to handle hazardous biological materials. In this animation, we show a class two biosafety cabinet. A fan pulls air from the workspace floor, pushing it through high efficiency particulate air filters, HEPA filters, some of the clean air exhausts to the room and some flows downwards. Contaminated air from biohazardous materials is simultaneously pulled and pushed downward and then cleaned. This simultaneous push and pull of air eliminates most of the adverse recirculation patterns typical of traditional chemical fume hoods. There are numerous other examples of enclosing hoods. Here a hood specifically designed for barrel filling is shown. When material such as a powder is dropped into a barrel, it displaces air in the barrel. If the material is dusty, the displaced air will contain many particles. The barrel filling hood captures this particle laden air before it enters the workplace. Another example is a ventilated tunnel. Here we show a ventilated tunnel that fully encloses a dusty process, such as grinding as parts move along a conveyor belt. The tunnel helps reduce the volume of air required to ventilate this type of a process. The second type of hoods are capturing hoods. In capturing hoods, the source is external to the hood and the airflow must generate sufficient velocity at the source to reach out and capture the contaminant. In general, many issues can reduce performance of capturing hoods, such as cross drafts and user placement. The required capture velocity to attain good effectiveness with a capturing hood depends on the contaminant. Dusts require higher velocities than fumes and gases. The actual capture velocity 
at the source depends on how far away the hood is. For an open round duct, we can model capture efficiency as a sphere with a radius x, where x is the distance from the duct. The capture area can then be expressed as pi times x squared. Capture velocity is equal to the airflow divided by the capture area, which is dependent on distance squared. Thus, the capture velocity is related to 1 over distance squared, or the inverse square law. The bottom line is that capture velocities are high near the duct and rapidly diminish with distance away from the opening. This is depicted in the image where smoke is being used to visualize capture velocity entering an open duct. Capture velocity is low away from the duct where the smoke follows curly paths and then increases close to the duct opening. The smoke begins to follow straight paths. This welder is using an exterior hood to capture fumes and gases emitted by welding. The hood must be placed in the proper position so that the air at the contaminant source entrains the fumes and gases, pulling them into the ventilation system. Capture is most effective when the hood is positioned close to and angled to face the source. If the hood is not angled toward the fume source, capture will be poor regardless of proximity because air velocity is insufficient to entrain the contaminant. Likewise, if the hood is positioned too far away from the fume source, capture will again be poor because of insufficient air velocity where it is needed at the source. The slotted hood is a special type of capturing hood. Often, slotted hoods are used to ventilate tanks. In this tank, hexavalent chromium is being used to plate chrome onto the wheels of a car, producing highly toxic vapors. A slotted hood can be used to capture these vapors. The slot ensures that air velocity is sufficient over the entire surface of the tank for good capture. The third type of hoods are receiving hoods. Receiving hoods use the momentum of the process to improve capture efficiency over other types of hoods. Here we will consider a grinding wheel that throws particle contaminants with high inertia into the air. High efficiencies at low air flows can be achieved with a receiving hood aligned with the typical trajectory of particles thrown from the grinding wheel. In contrast, a capturing hood not aligned with the inertia of the particles is a poor choice because the high velocities required to achieve high capture efficiency. If high capture efficiency is possible at all. A canopy hood is a type of receiving hood that receives vapors or fumes rising due to the thermal energy from a hot source. Here a hot sodium bath is being used to blacken a steel part. The resulting vapors rising because the bath is hot are often captured with a canopy hood easily at a reasonably low fan speed. However, when large parts are dipped, the exhaust volume may be insufficient to capture vapors. Although the fan may be operated at a higher speed to achieve adequate capture, this configuration requires more power and may not be economical. Canopy hoods are not recommended for cold processes or those that emit vapors that are more dense than air. When a steel gear is dipped in a room temperature hydrochloric acid in descaling, the heavier than air vapors do not rise to meet the canopy hood. If possible at all, much higher fan speeds are needed to capture these vapors, perhaps 10 times or more than the hot process. The hood used to capture dust from an angle grinder is a good example of a receiving hood. In this case, a worker is using an angle grinder to remove mortar between bricks as part of a process known as tuck pointing. Without capture, the grinder throws debris and large quantities of dust into the air, often resulting in very high exposures to dust and more importantly crystalline silica from the sand in the mortar. 
A hood consisting of a shroud with a heavy-duty vacuum can be used to dramatically reduce dust exposures. The shroud is specially designed with the vacuum positioned to receive the dust as it is thrust into the air by the inertial energy of the grinding wheel. A special type of ventilation called push-pull ventilation can be used to ventilate tanks. We have already seen how a slotted capture hood can be used effectively to reach out and pull vapors into an exhaust ventilation system. These systems are quite common and very effective in many situations. However, the distance that a pull-only system can reach out is quite limited. Thus, vapor capture is often not sufficient for wide tanks. We can, however, dramatically increase the width of effective capture by pushing clean air over the tank. The clean air pushes the vapor to an area of effective capture where it can be pulled into the ventilation system. Thus, even for wide tanks, push-pull ventilation can effectively prevent vapors from entering the workplace. Now let's turn our attention more specifically to the engineering control of nanomaterials in the workplace. We can break this up into two categories primary production of the nanomaterial, and secondary handling of the nanomaterial after production. For further reference, I recommend the excellent resource from NIOSH, Current Strategies for Engineering Controls in Nanomaterial Production and Downstream Handling Processes. Publication number 2014-102. Let's start with the primary production of nanomaterials. Many processes are used to generate nanomaterials, including gas phase processes, chemical vapor deposition, colloidal or liquid phase methods, mechanical processes such as grinding, milling, and alloying, dip pen lithography, to name a few. The best practice is to fully enclose the process to the maximum extent possible. This image shows complete enclosure of a reactor to produce carbon nanotubes. The enclosure is ventilated to provide a negative pressure environment for the reactor. The amount of ventilation should take into account the fact that air should be moving through all gaps into the enclosure during normal operation. Special attention is needed for harvesting of nanomaterials and cleanout of reactors. This image shows a typical chemical vapor deposition tube furnace for producing carbon nanotubes. Although the process is fully contained during production, the nanotubes must be harvested from the inner walls of the tube furnace. The harvesting process is the step most likely to lead to exposures, so ventilation is required during this step. There are numerous steps in the downstream handling of nanomaterials that can lead to exposures. Large-scale discharge of powder into containers and bags, small-scale powder handling, use of product in the laboratory, or manufacturing environment, further processing of products containing nanomaterials, such as cutting, grinding, and drilling, or maintenance of production or ventilation systems. Large-scale discharge of product into bins or bags can result in substantial exposures. As we mentioned before, in barrel filling, the product causes the air to rapidly leave the container, taking with it small dust out and into the workplace. This situation can be avoided by using a partial enclosure that covers the open area of the container being filled. Alternatively, a continuous liner system 
can be used that eliminates the movement of air out into the workplace. When these types of controls are in place, exposures can be low during normal operation. However, care must be taken to have specific protocol in place to ensure that exposures remain low when the systems are serviced. Some examples of small-scale handling include charging powders into secondary containers, weighing powder for shipping, and packing powders for shipping. Chemical fume hoods can be effective, and constant velocity fume hoods work well. Constant volume and bypass hoods, the traditional hoods, are less effective and require more attention to secondary air currents as discussed earlier. Biosafety cabinets are effective. Glove boxes are also effective, but can be difficult to work with for common operations. Finally, powder handling enclosures are effective and potentially less costly alternative to other types of hoods if purchasing new equipment. This slide shows powder handling hoods. These hoods are specially designed to avoid problems of recirculation typical of constant volume chemical fume hoods. All steps in maintaining production equipment and ventilation equipment must have a protocol in place to limit exposures of maintenance staff. For example, in this photo, a worker is changing the high efficiency particulate air filter of a ventilation system that services nanomaterial handling operations. The protocol involves wearing a respirator, wearing specific protective clothing, and bagging of the HEPA filter. Ventilation systems require periodic evaluation and troubleshooting. Once installed, ventilation systems are often forgotten. However, it's critical to periodically evaluate the effectiveness of all engineering controls. In some cases, controls may appear to be working, but they may not be. The steps to evaluate the effectiveness of a control system are provided in this flowchart. The first step is to evaluate all information that can be gathered on the system, including talking to workers and maintenance staff, collecting documentation such as system schematics and performance over time, and exposure and emission data. Performing an initial walkthrough to look for obvious problems such as vibration, excessive noise, heat, suction, damaged ducts or hoods, open doors. If there is an obvious problem, then it should be fixed, and then periodically the system should be checked. If there is no obvious problem, then the system should be assessed quantitatively. System pressures, such as hood static pressures, velocities, transport velocity, and air cleaner pressure drop should be measured. These values should be compared to expected values, or original design values, and corrective actions should be selected based on these observations. Common failures include airflow being too low at the hood or multiple hoods, contaminant concentrations being too high despite ventilation operating as designed, or noise that is so high that it creates a hazard or a nuisance. Insufficient airflow could be due to common maintenance problems. Fan belts, for example, may be loose, causing slipping of the fan blades. Fans may be wired incorrectly, causing backwards rotation, in which case you still get airflow, but it is very low. Or fan bearings may require grease. Buildup of contaminant in the connecting ducts 
or dirty air cleaners, such as air filters, can increase system pressure drop and reduce airflow. Lastly, damaged or clogged exhaust ducts are fairly easy to check. If a stack is bent or clogged with snow, for example, system pressure drop increases and airflow decreases. It is important to evaluate hoods. The measurement of static pressure in the duct downstream of the hood is an easy and excellent indicator of hood airflow over time. In some cases, velocity should be measured to make sure that airflow is distributed over the entire area where contaminants are generated. Although static pressure and velocity require specialty equipment, smoke can be used to visualize capture and containment of contaminants. This type of visualization is often enough to perform basic troubleshooting. Here we show smoke being used to visualize airflow in a biosafety hood. In the top image, the path of the smoke is straight, indicating a high capture velocity and good contaminant removal. In the lower image, the smoke initially follows a curly path indicating low velocities and the possibility of incomplete capture. Also in the lower image, the smoke path changes to a straight line when the fume nears the hood, indicating higher velocity and better capture. There are numerous sources of smoke that can be used for this purpose. Smoke tubes produce smoke by chemical reaction. There are also generators that produce smoke by condensation of a heated vapor. The wizard stick from a company called Zero Toys is an inexpensive smoke generator that can be used for this purpose. In summary, in this presentation we described how engineering fits within the hierarchy of controls. We related engineering controls to specific nanotechnology processes. And finally, we identified ways to evaluate engineering controls. This lesson has been created by the Midwest Emerging Technologies Public Health and Safety Training METFAST program, a collaboration of the University of Minnesota School of Public Health, the University of Iowa College of Public Health, and Dakota County Technical College. Funding for the METFAST program is provided by the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences of the National Institutes of Health. The content of this lesson is solely the responsibility of the developers and does not necessarily represent the official views of National Institutes of Health.